Okay. Hi, my name is Deshawn Carr, and I'm a policy analyst on the higher education team here at New America. Two cases currently sit with SCOTUS, Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard College and Student for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina, which could likely ban colleges and universities from considering race as a factor in their admissions process. If SCOTUS decides to overturn affirmative action, we can expect to see many damaging and rippling effects throughout the higher education system and other institutions. Here at New America, we acknowledge that we are not experts on affirmative action. However, we are dedicated to making sure higher education um, is more equitable and accountable, fighting for inclusion rather than exclusivity, so that everyone can obtain an affordable, high quality education. Therefore, we are very committed to using our platform to uplift those with deep expertise and knowledge to raise awareness and spark cohesive dialogue on creating future policies to ensure that higher education institutions are a guiding light in embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion. So today I'm going to be talking um, with a colleague of mine, Maya Emerson Lubin. Um, we're going to be just discussing, you know, what can what some potential policy uh, could look like if affirmative action is overturned. And again, Maya, thank you. Um, myself and New America, we appreciate you for taking the time to speak with us on this topical issue, as what was some would say is the big elephant weighing over our heads in the higher education right now, and that's affirmative action. Um, but I want to just start off our conversation um, just learning more about you and your work, and you know what interested you in working in this particular policy space. Yeah, thank you, Deshaun. And to New America, you mentioned that you all are experts, but you still see um, the precarious place our nation is in with regard to our democratic values of equal opportunity and strength and diversity. Um, and, and I appreciate you all um, uh, having these conversations, given how important this topic is. So how did I end up here? Um, I, I am from a place called Meridian, Mississippi, where rich culture and joy and deep roots abound, um, but also uh, palpable are the impacts of divestment and disenfranchisement and a lack of access to opportunity. Um, and I knew early on that in the realm of education was my space to do something about all of that. So I started early serving, um, I left Meridian and went to Mississippi State University, my alma mater, and served as the first black female student body president there. Um, now, I don't mention that just to pat myself on the back. I mentioned that because upon leaving Mississippi State, um, I used that intimate knowledge of of the higher ed system and research and data, um, but most importantly, the stories and the voices of communities um, to, to craft a career that makes change. Um, so, so that's how I ended up here and in this particular space. Thank you for sharing. And I think honestly, that's a good, a good segue into my next question, because you said you're, you know, you're in the South. Um, and a lot of interesting things are cooking up in the South, I guess, right now, currently with, you know, with Florida and Texas, um, yeah. stuff that's around their DEI efforts. Um, do you think their actions are a precursor to what we might see unfold nationwide if affirmative action is overturned? And what is at stake for higher education institutions in their current DEI efforts and initiatives? Yeah, well, you use the word interesting <laughs> to describe uh, those efforts in, in Texas and Florida. And those are generous words to use to describe what's happening there. And um, even in Ohio, where they are considering a bill that would restructure higher ed as that state knows it. Um, so firstly, you mentioned um, you know, what would be the effects of if, uh, if affirmative action is overruled. It's important to note for folks that the ruling will not be as simple as affirmative action is upheld or affirmative action is struck down. It's gonna be really important, particularly for, fo for folks whose work touches this area to not breathe in the headlines, but to interpret or go to trusted sources to read and interpret the decision before reacting and possibly overcorrecting. Now. Why do I say this? Think back to the California Prop 209 affirmative action fight, right? California, as you know, struck down affirmative action, but because um, folks across the P through 20 pipeline sort of overread the decision and overcorrected the negative effects of gutting affirmative action, um, like sharp declines in underrepresented minority students um, in higher ed were exasperated. So this of course is no indictment on those folks. It's a lesson for us to learn from. 
With that said, um, we have to zoom out a little bit and reject the idea that attacks on affirmative action and attacks on DEI and attacks on curriculum and true history and book bans under the guise of CRT are all isolated. We are in the throes of a well-coordinated, well-funded strategic attack on equal opportunity. And while I caution this community to not overcorrect, I must also warn folks that the other side is gonna take even a whiff of a negative ruling on affirmative action and ring the alarm. Um, they will certainly use the ruling to jump much further than the ruling actually reaches. Um, and they will use it as ammunition to beef up efforts that we are seeing sprout all across the country that you mentioned. And finally, yes, there's a lot at stake for our institutions of higher learning, but um, instead of zooming out this time, I ask that we zoom in a little bit. Um, much is at stake for institutions, but everything is at stake for underrepresented students of color across this country and for their futures and in turn the futures of their community and in turn the future of the health of our democracy. So everybody has skin in the game at this point. Oh yeah, for sure. And I, I love that what you said about, you know, zooming in because again, like just this these cases and alone, I mean, affirmative action has been talked about for many, many years. When you even brought up California, I'm like, that's my home state. You yeah. know, like I've seen like I've I I was like, I went to, you know, I went to the school where, mm -hmm. you know, the whole where it took place, UC Davis. So I'm like, it's just interesting to see how like, you know, other states have been doing this stuff already. And it's just like now it's gonna be particularly nationwide. Um, and I know you touched you touched a little bit about um, you know critical race theory, and I kind of want to get in a little bit of that and looking at how that dialogue is going to also unfold too, because I know there's been a lot of you know conservative I would say conservative leaning states um, have been looking to also ban critical race theory and what that means in different systems of higher education or even just education itself. You know what would I guess a ban on affirmative action have on that dialogue around critical race theory? Well. First, let's start with the facts. <laughs> this movement around critical race theory is being spearheaded by politically motivated actors and lawmakers, not educators, the issue, ex the issue area experts here, um, making the whole movement fundamentally flimsy. So let's just sit with that truth, first of all. Um, and like I'm sure so many of the folks listening, I gnash my teeth when I think about how our national conversation and our state legislatures have failed miserably with regard to CRT. Um, many legislatures considering CRT bans are shaky at best on what CRT even is and our inability to have a national conversation that has a standard basic foundation of fact has spiraled this conversation out of control. So, you know, to put it simply, your third grader is not learning about critical race theory in class. Um, CRT is being used as a tool to meddle in curriculum and push an agenda that does not value equal opportunity. Um, but that aside, as I mentioned earlier, if the Supreme Court does decide to overturn affirmative action, again, it's important that we um, interrogate the scope of that decision before, before overcorrecting. If they do overturn affirmative action, we can expect this conversation to spiral more out of control. I'm sorry um, to be the bearer of bad news, but the arbiters of power and ill will toward equity will make will take the decision and use it as ammunition to undermine the integrity of curriculum and the teaching of true accurate history. Um, and you know, if we know what to expect, which at this point we do, we've seen it across the country, it has to be on us to be ready to fight back and even find ways to be proactive and get out in front of these efforts before they arise in our states. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with all, all those. <laughs> I was gonna say snaps to all those. <laughs> You know, and I think the conversation also goes back to, you know, I'm thinking also about basic needs. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of institutions are always looking for ways to support students, whether that's through, you know, social, economic. And, you know, one thing that's, you know, an important factor that I want to, you know, I guess a not important factor, but important need that I always want to be lifting up is thinking about when do we start talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion as a basic need? I know we do a lot of work around like, you know, disaggregating data by racial equity, like, you know, racial, ethnic, um, gender categories, but at the same time, it's like, when do we actually have a conversation when we start to say like, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and even belonging is a basic need on campus. I know as someone who identifies as a black student going to a, P a PWI, 
and you seeing a you know a familiar face that looks just like you on campus and saying hey you know you felt included and you felt belong you know how do we start to bring in those conversations to the basic needs conversation but then also at the same time who do we bring to that who are those players that we bring into the conversation yeah, man, Sean, I love this question so much. Um, and maybe selfishly because of the work that I get to do um, with student leaders. So I didn't speak much about my work earlier. So if I can, I, I will now. So at the Lawyers Committee, I lead a project called the Reason Project. And the Reason Project is an initiative designed to center students and alumni and community voice in identifying targeted sustainable strategies to increase equity and access and opportunity for underrepresented students of color. Um, we particularly focus on state flagships because of their important role. Um, the project is led by um, multi-sector state-based coalitions in Illinois and Ohio, um, and those coalitions convene key stakeholders in developing innovative policies to jumpstart improved higher ed racial equity. So not only did our coalitions dig into the inner workings of these institutions by analyzing data, right, and examining policy and understanding the history of the institution in the region, et cetera, um, we also held a number of focus groups that we called campus conversations. Um, these students, additionally, students were um, and are a key part of the work of the Reason Project. For example, um, our Reason Coalition student advocates pulled together students from across their respective campuses to evaluate their campuses and share their own recommendations with our coalition and share it with their university administration. Separately, as a part of our affirmative action work, we have connected with student leaders at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, Harvard, um, University of Texas at Austin, Yale, and more. Um, oh, in fact, I spent this past weekend in community with student leaders organizing themselves around campus equity at UNC, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And in working with these student leaders and discussing their challenges and triumphs that they've experienced as it relates to um, post-secondary education, I have been struck emotionally and personally, actually, by one underlying thread. So student leaders have, speaking about basic needs, right, student leaders have discussed things like long wait times and a lack of faculty and staff diversity at counseling centers. They have, um, one institution is in a food desert um, and, and students discuss how rampant hunger was on campus, in particular for students of color. Even as I say that out loud, I'm remembering um, my time as student body president, I was talking about how students were hungry on campus and we need to do something about it. And a colleague of mine said, oh, I didn't even know that was a problem because I eat at said fraternity house. So, right, that's why we have to be in, in conversation with students. Um, but the most poignant need that students point out over and over again is a thirst for simple safety, Deshaun. Physical, emotional, intellectual safety. This weekend, when engaging with the student leaders at UNC, listen to this, 80% of their concerns fell under the category of safety. Um, and you don't have to take my word for it. I, I have a, a paragraph from one of our student leaders from these campus conversations. So listen to their words. I'll call this student J. When I look to my left and look to my right in lecture hall when I was in econ class, the professor says, work with someone. The person to my right, I'm hoping they don't call me the N word or something crazy like that. And the person to my left, I hope they're not afraid of me. It's a duality that you have to deal with as a black student. And I feel like if our school was committed to the idea that we succeed together, then people would feel uncomfortable holding those opinions in classes. And I feel like it would make the experience a lot better for everyone. Because from what I've noticed, black students are often coming into those environments willing to work with people, willing to meet new people and have a study buddy from other parts of the world. And we just aren't met with the same energy. <sighs> That's from a student leader. When she said that, it, it rocked my world, right? So during the affirmative action or argument, there was an exchange with Justice Thomas where he declares, you know, I'd like you to tell me expressly when a parent sends a kid to college, they don't necessarily send them, send them there to have fun or feel good or anything like that. 
They send them there to learn physics or chemistry or whatever they're studying. Let me tell you something. That student in that quote that I read earlier um, is not describing a need to feel good or to have fun. That student came to learn. But the environment that they described is not an ideal environment for anyone to learn in. Mm. And let me say this, that student is brilliant and that student is fine in spite of, but why do they deserve to put the world on their back and fight to get to college and then just survive when they get there? Let's go back to high school and let's discuss Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Safety and belonging being key. So why don't students of color deserve to have their basic needs met as they contribute to our campuses and to our communities? Mm -hmm. um, and in case you're unsure of where I'm going with this yet, who are the players that need to be involved in this conversation? Students, start there. They are the issue area experts and they are who should be at the table when we start to have these conversations. Thank you for that question. No, no, thank you for answering. And I appreciate, you know, you you, you hit on a lot of different points <clears throat> on a lot of different things. And I even like, you, I was like, yes, 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 to all those, because I'm like, definitely for sure on the student voice and student perspective, like, these are the ones who are mostly impacted by this issue. They should definitely be at the table. And then also in terms of like safety, like it's one thing I think, and this is probably, I'm about to go into maybe a little small tangent myself, but it's like, how can we, you know, we tell these students to apply to these schools and parents are seeing them off. And I know even though I went to school down the street from my parents and, you know, but even just them like wondering, like, is my child going to be safe? So the thing is, is like, how do we expect for, you know, people to pay all this money to somewhere that you're paying all this money and then they, they can't even have, have safety or it can't be promised that they're going to be safe. Um, and that's not, that's, that's not okay. Um, so it's just like thinking about all these different things and about who are these key players. Yes, yeah, students should be at the table and also safety. Um, you know, when it comes to your racial identity, people do don't forget about like, yeah, I want to be safe when I go to go to when I go to go to class or when I go back to my apartment after leaving class. Like those things are so important. And I think, you know, people tend to forget about the niche of what's what's going on. Um, so sorry if I went off in a tangent too. Oh, no, um, as you were talking, <laughs> you know, another memory came to mind when I was back on campus, which was like ages ago. Um, I was um I worked in, in the football department and we would host families, right, and, and um, uh, recruits as they came to campus. And the parents of color always pulled me aside. And they were like, is my son going to be safe here? <laughs> right? So uh, <laughs> is, is he going to be okay, you know, here in, in, in Mississippi and, and um, on, on this campus that has the makeup that it does, right? So safety is is huge for for these students um and and it has to be a part of the conversation so i'm sorry no <laughs> no no <laughs> no because like you said it's definitely yeah it definitely resonates with me and and again like i think we we focus on getting the student in to college but we never think about the supports that they need when they get there and that is definitely lacking when it comes to students of color um and i guess this is now going into like i guess the policy side of of, of the questions i have um, but I think, you know, at New America, you know, we are very focused on, you know, federal policy, just given our location being in Washington, D.C. But I'm curious to know, like, what would you like Congress and the White House to know about, you know, the fallout if affirmative action is overturned? And, you know, and how could the decision affect federal policy, like other other different higher ed policy matters? And what can Congress do to maintain and improve access for students of color? Yeah, um, Great question. So many groups are and will be grappling with this, and I'm sure your other guests will dig into the policy specifics. So, you know, I'm actually going to come at this from a different angle. So yes, we need policy solutions. Let's talk about them, right? But we also must realize um, that we are in a political battle for the soul of this nation, and higher ed and education is just one of the many battlefields. And so it's going to be important for our federal government from the White House to Congress to one, educate themselves on the ram on the ramifications of the moment we find ourselves in, in education. Um, 
And you can do that by reaching out to all the great groups, right, um, that are doing this work. But it's also important that they are vocal champions of equal opportunity and are reclaiming the narrative around race. And they're convening and supporting institutional leaders that are navigating this tricky landscape. And finally, it's going to be important that they signal to students the future of our nation, that their leaders are on their side. And so um, I may be disappointing you that I'm not giving you a really technical no, no, no. Policy answer, <laughs> but, but that is only one side of the solution here. And because this is not only a policy challenge, we are in a political battle. Um, we're going to need our leaders to recognize that and to step up in that way as well. It's absolutely critical that they are um, the champions out there really lifting up our core American value of valuing diversity and equal opportunity. So I think that's going to be um, um, on the front lines, right? The first step. Um, of leadership from the federal government is mm -hmm. going to be being really vocal around our core values, right? And then living out those core values by the policy decisions that they make, of course. Definitely, definitely. Um, and then my last question, you know, I, I think this is going into the general public because, uh, you know, a lot is, it's kind of quiet right now on this issue because I think everyone is just on pins and needles just waiting to hear, you know, what the decision is going to be. But what would you like for the general public, you know, take away from what is unfolding? Mm -hmm. And what is one fear you have about the upcoming decision? And what is one hope? Yeah, um, hope's important. I'm glad you, you ended in there. So affirmative action um, was our government's response to right or wrong. That's what I want the public to understand. The wrong being that bright, brilliant, beautiful, black and brown and indigenous young people were being systematically kept out of institutions of higher learning. So we implemented a policy to act affirmatively to right a wrong. So my first fear would be around us taking an adverse Supreme Court ruling as a ruling on our values. Now, affirmative action being diluted or taken away um, does not absolve this country nor individual states nor higher education institutions of the responsibility to again, act affirmatively to ensure everyone, including students of color across this country have access to higher education. So that's what I'm feeling on, on the fears. So again, as I've mentioned earlier, affirmative action is lawful and necessary and helpful full stop. However, I'll ask folks to zoom out again and remind you that affirmative action was never meant to be a silver bullet. It was never meant to solve every challenge regarding equity in higher education, and it would be unfor and it would be unfortunate, um, and we should do some collective mourning if that tool is stripped from us. However, I find hope in the fact that there are still measures that we can take to ensure that our education system reflects our values again of equal opportunity. And here's the next thing that gives me hope: there are um, still a plethora of professionals upstream and downstream, right, who are committed to just that, um, equal opportunity and higher education. So for just as much fear as I have, Deshaun, I also have as much hope. And that's good to hear. I am so glad. I I, I try to, I wanted to end um, this call on a, on a good note and, and leave, you know, viewers who are going to be tuning into this, you know, just just to know that there is hope out there and, okay. and the work and the work is going to get done. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to get done no That's matter right. what. Together. <laughs> together, together. That's why it's like collaboration is key. Teamwork okay. makes the dream work. All those little, the sayings that everyone says, it, it, it's going to work out. Um, and yeah, and again, thank you so much for, for joining me and also collaborating with myself in New America on this, what we're calling now the Affirmative Action Listening Tour. Um, where we're just speaking with experts and scholars um, and advocates like you who are just doing amazing work in this field already. And we just want to give y'all a platform um, to, you know, showcase your work and just hear your thoughts on what what next steps is going to be um, in terms of policy and what the future of higher education is going to be if 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 SCOTUS decides to ruffle feathers. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, but nevertheless, thank you. I'm proud to be a part of the listening tour um, and look forward to being collaborators, no matter what comes from the Supreme Court um, come this summer. Thank you.